wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the world. In the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks. Chris Voss here from thechrisvossshow.com. Thechrisvossshow.com. Hey, we're going to be with another great podcast. We certainly appreciate you guys tuning in. Be sure to go to youtube.com and see the video version of this recording at youtube.com forward slash Chris Voss. Also go to goodreads.com and all the groups we have on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, all that different stuff. You can just search for the Chris Voss Show over there and you'll find all sorts of fun things. And today we have an amazing entrepreneur on the show. His name is Tyler Bray. He is an entrepreneur that started his first business at the age of 14. He and his company have been consecutively listed on the Inc. 5000 the past three years as one of the fastest growing privately held companies in the nation. Tyler and his young team have brought cutting edge digital commerce practices to the trailer parts industry. He's regularly published in Forbes, where he writes about business leadership workplace culture and related topics welcome to the show tyler how are you i'm doing well thank you for having me chris good and tell us the company that you that you created and, and run the f- company that i first started was called and is, is still called tk trailer parts that's the company that i started when i was 14 and it's the company that i'm running still today and if you don't mind me asking how old are you today so how many years has this company been in business i am 22 years old and my company started officially August 23rd, 2013. And I'm going to be turning 23 here June 20th. So it's coming up really fast. <laughs> Congratulations. Congratulations. So what does your company do? Give us an idea of the concept of it and the dot com too as well. Yes. Yeah, so my company started off, my stepfather runs a trailer manufacturing company. So when I was a little kid, I wanted to get into entrepreneurship. So he let me utilize some of his inventory that he used to build his trailers to start flipping online. So we started mm. selling tires, wheels, axles, lights, things of that nature on eBay and Craigslist. And from there, it's grown to what it is today. And right now we are a full service distribution company for trailer parts where we service end user customers who have their own trailers, repair shops, and also people who total manufacturing plants that build many trailers. So we do wholesale and retail. We service the whole entire nation. Wow. So you, what, what, could it be said that you basically took this little business and turned it on, online, but it sounds like you did your own thing? Yeah, it, it did start online as like a, a little thing and it grew to much bigger than I thought it would. Now we have a .com, the trailerpartsoutlet.com that we sell to end users. And uh, we also have a full recently renovated 10,000 square foot warehouse on five acres that we ship everything out of. And that's how we operate. And it's pretty cool because you guys sell all this different hardware that like when you think of it like an online business, people are thinking, well, I get some eBooks or something from there or Amazon type stuff. You guys are selling the stuff that auto parts, things of that nature. I like to say that I started the quote unquote drop shipping and dot com e-commerce fulfillment stuff oh, before it was go. cool. And now it's cool. You got Gary V, you got all these big guys talking about these e-commerce things and it's definitely very lucrative, but we are moving big parts through small package through freight and it's different than what you would imagine drop shipping would be. Yeah, it's quite the business. Like people don't realize like Amazon, yeah, there's stuff you can sell on Amazon. Walmart's got reseller now. And then eBay, of course, you can sell stuff on. It's really extraordinary, all the different things. I remember one time I was at my storage unit in Vegas and I, I bumped in this guy and he I walked past his storage unit and it was all like an inventory of parts for some sort of automotive stuff. And uh, I'm like, hey, you got a lot of parts there. And he's like, yeah, we're run an eBay, Amazon business and sell the stuff. And it's really crazy. And, and, and his whole business was basically uh, aside from the online aspect of it, run, you know, his inventory was <laughs> storage. You know, I was like, awesome. there's opportunity everywhere. It's crazy nowadays with how lucrative online businesses can be, what opportunities there are out there. And I know a guy who sells toilet paper and is absolutely like doing extremely well for himself. You can sell anything online nowadays. Yeah. 
Yeah. And, and if you want, you can go to my OnlyFans account, OnlyFans forward slash Chris Fought. No, I'm just kidding. That's a joke. I always do on Clubhouse. <laughs> but uh, you won't find me over there. The uh, Yeah, I know. I know. But I, after this pandemic, I am going back to my old stripper job at Thunder Down Under in Las Vegas. So I'm just, I got to get in a little bit more shape. But What's I, I'm the name going, that I need to look up? It's under, boy, I, I didn't <laughs> finish this joke clearly when I wrote it. But it's going to be under Magic Voss, I think. Magic okay, Voss. That's I think a good that's one. the name we're going for. Yeah. Crystal <laughs> Voss. I like that. I like that. I think I'm going with that. As long as there's no other Crystal Vosses there at the club, it's usually okay. So just waiting for Vegas to open back up. Oh, and yeah. We'll be back there. So I'll be your first customer. <laughs> there you go. Aside from, uh, aside from me, <laughs> right now my audience is like thinking me a thought. So uh, as you grew this business, there's a lot of challenges to growing business. And, and we mentioned a little bit in your bio and things that go into this. There were aspects that sound similar to me, what you did. Uh, what was some of your journey that you went through at discovering how to build a business, how to get a business running, culture aspects, things of that nature that you incorporate now that you're pretty proud of? So starting the business at 14 years old, I dropped out of high school, public high school. So I started doing online school while running my business full time. Wow. I didn't have a social life like most 14, 15, 16, 17 year olds. So when they say that entrepreneurship is a lonely road, it really is. <laughs> And with the way that culture is right now, unemployment rates extremely low. And it's not like before where it's just do your job. People ask me all the time how I hire people and it's how I would make friends. How do I make friends? And mm. so I treat, I hire and I cultivate a team around people that I would get along with, people that I can trust. And that's just the way that I've been doing it since the very beginning, just because that's all I knew. My business was my social life. My team was the, were the people that I hung around all day long. And so culture is an extremely important aspect to me because you spend the majority of your life working. Mm -hmm. And why would you want to work at a place that's not enjoyable? Why would you want to work at a place where you don't feel like you're growing? So I think those are all extremely important fundamental aspects of creating a team and building a successful culture. Is your workplace a place where people would want to work? And so, plus, you set the tone because you're the man on the what we call the man on the white horse who right. sets that tone. So you might as well make it fun or at least interesting. Definitely. So going back to the hardships, like I said, entrepreneurship was a very lonely road and it still is. When I was 17 years old, I fell into a brief depression just because I wasn't able to spend time with other 17, 16 year olds and do the stupid fun stuff that other people would be doing at that age. And so I actually decided to go back to finish up my diploma in high school in a public school setting. And I tried to run my business remotely mm -hmm. and that wasn't successful. I fell into hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt because I wasn't focusing on my company. But what wow. that's taught me is to be able to create a team where that's possible. And it's extremely important in today's time because of the virtuality of leadership. I'm actually attending college right now as well. And learning from those past mistakes in my high school times, I was able to navigate all the obstacles to be able to run my business virtually. Yeah. It, that's the one that thing a lot of people don't understand about being an entrepreneur is the loneliness. The You're doing everything. And I remember in the early days of my company, I would be, I'd be the first one to open, first one to or last one to close or whatever. In fact, a lot of times I had to instruct my employees in the morning, don't bring people, don't bring people, if the door is locked, you know, or, or at 9 a.m., don't set your appointments for 9 a.m. or at least call me ahead of time, make sure I'm awake and moving around. Because a lot of times they would open the door uh, to meet a client and I'm there asleep on the couch. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh my goodness. Funny story. One time, 14, 15 years old, I was working from eight o'clock in the morning till 2 a.m. every mm -hmm. single morning. And I loved every second of it. But this one time I was shirtless in my office and just working <laughs> and two officers walked into my building and they're oh. like, who are you? What's going on? I was like, okay, I run the company. It's okay. And they're like, okay, we just want to make sure nothing weird is happening. And then there I am talking to two officers in my building without a shirt on. It was a surprise. <laughs> yeah. And that's always bad because I watched a lot of the cops TV show and it's always the guy who doesn't have a shirt on. That's the guy who's going to jail that night, <laughs> right. but usually he's in a trailer home. So there's that, but no, it's, it's really lonely. You're doing all the work. I remember the early days of trying to do everything 
And it, it can be really challenging. I remember at one point, I just, we started a courier company and then a year and a half later, we started a mortgage company. And it was just, oh my God, I don't know what, I just was completely out of my mind. And uh, I had a lot of ADD, so I had some drive to it. I had the CEO disease, but even then all that energy could not, could not compete. And I remember I used, I <laughs> went to my, my business partner, I said, dude, the only reason I go home is to change clothes, shower, and come back. We should just install a shower in the office, and then I never right. have, I can just live there. Yeah, you go through the journey. You go through the tribulations. You go through the ups and downs. I never went to college. Like you said, you're, you dropped out of high school. And once you get this drug, this entrepreneur drug, it's hard to, it's hard to let go, man. It's, like, it's the worst addiction. Yeah, it's the worst and the best addiction, right? <laughs> and it's it's the best addiction because you're you become self actualized. You, you you really learn a lot about yourself. You go through stuff that most people don't go through. If you want to talk to some of that, yeah. Funny thing that you said about ADD. I was recently quote unquote diagnosed with ADHD as well. I went to a, one of my buddies. She owns a a psycho neurological examination clinic, and she wanted to do an exam on me, and I found out that I had ADHD. And the funny thing is, as she said, most entrepreneurs have yeah. ADHD and it's not really, a lot of people look at it as a disorder, which it is, but it's it actually is. a superpower yeah. you know, if you use it in the right way. Yeah. So I just thought that was really interesting to put. That That's on. why they call it the CEO disease. It's uh, everybody has it they, and just keep it in check because there are times I, there were some times where I had to go get some elephant tranquilizers and <laughs> calm down because I was having anxiety fits eventually. But just to keep in check. I, yeah. I remember I used to do a lot of, I used to go for a two hour massage every Saturday at one point when we really reached a, a high scale. And if I skipped it, my employees the next week could be like, you didn't do your two hour massage this week, did you? I'm like, why? And they're like, because you're being a real asshole this week, we can tell. What, do you want to talk some more about culture? Because culture is really important. I learned that from a lot of reading I did and laying a foundation of the right culture. What are some other aspects of culture that you're, you're doing in your business to make sure that it runs well? Yeah, first speaking towards that massage, which is going to rope into the, the culture <laughs> thing. When I go into the office and I try to stay out of the office as much as possible nowadays, focusing on working on the business and not in the business, oh, they call me the Tyler tornado. And so I come in and I just shake things up so much and I have to keep that in check too. I got to mm. make sure I balance that and make sure that my guys are comfortable where they're working because change all the time isn't necessarily healthy. So speaking towards the culture aspect, 75% of my guys are considered millennials or younger. Mm -hmm. I have guys who work with me who are in management positions who are younger than I am. It's really interesting, the culture that I've cultivated, I would say, just because when you think of a team running a nine-figure trailer parts company, you don't think of a bunch of ragtag young kids, you know, running. Yeah, you think of old guys like me who are all grizzled <laughs> and shit. And... I just think, especially in today's world, culture is essential. A good culture is essential to making a business not only successful but thrive and just efficient because i think the most important part about my job is to actually listen and learn from my guys right how do i help them get to where they want to be and how does tk trailer parts help them get to that point and i think that's how leaders become successful is to not only ensure that your company or your passion or your goal gets to where you want that goal or passion to be, but also how do you get your team to their passion and goals alongside your company? And I think that's what culture is all about. How do you get to that point where it's a mutually symbiotic relationship where everybody benefits from it? And at that point, everybody's happy, everybody's successful. Yeah, it, it definitely makes it, makes it work well. It's interesting, you've got a really young crowd, but they're really pr pretty good at, at selling and also doing the online thing. You gotta have people in your business that know how to master social media and online selling and all that sort of good stuff. It's extremely difficult sometimes because in order for you to get your team members to the point where they wanna be, it takes time. You have to know them, you have to be their friend. Those after hours, five, six, seven o'clock conversations about how's your family doing? How's your kid doing i think that's extremely important as a leader that sometimes people who are in a more corporate atmosphere don't really understand it's an integral part of running your operations to really get to know your people you know mm -hmm. what their strengths are what their weaknesses are what their hopes and dreams are and what they're you know not necessarily looking forward to and integrating all of that into the strategy of leading your team 
And you guys have been on the, the well, you've been published in Forbes. You've been in the, the Inc. 5000 for the past three years. What are some of the key traits that you've done to, to get yourself to that level and keep it that level? It's impossible to do everything yourself. And that's one yeah. thing that you, I'm sure you've been through that as well. It's absolutely impossible to do every aspect of your business. And so the way that I like to say it is I hire people onto my team who I think is going to do a better job than me. And so in order for me to scale past a one man team, two man team, three man team, for one, I got to let go. I had to learn to let go and trust in my team to be able to do what they do best. Yeah, that's that's the hardest part because when you're an entrepreneur, you want to pour everything in your business, you want to touch everything that you do, and you, it feels really personal. A lot of people have a hard time giving that up uh, about different things or trusting sometimes employees. What do you have advice do you have on giving that trust away? Where you like, like sometimes they're going to screw it up a couple times, and you're just like, oh god, this is going to be bad. I would say there's two different things. Going back to the thing that I said at the beginning, right? If you make friends, you hang out with them, and you are investing your time and your, your energy into that relationship, the same goes with your team, right? Do you trust that person? Are they your friend? Can you trust them to do the job? And of course, your friends are going to mess up. But what are the give and takes from that? What if you have to do everything yourself? Are you going to be as efficient? Are you going to make as much? Are you going to be able to do as much work and be as productive if you had to do bookkeeping, operations, and sales? Or can you trust your guys to do it? Because at the end of the day, they're going to mess up, but they're also going to do many different aspects that are going to be better than you. They're doing the job eight, nine, 10 hours a day. Whereas if you had to focus only one or two hours of your day, looking back at it, you got to think and you got to come to terms with the fact that they can and will do better if they're not then maybe you're not leading them correctly. That's very true. Leadership is really important. Are there any aspects or, or traits you want to give that uh, you use in leadership that really helped you? We've already talked about some of them, but is there any we've missed? I think that's the way that you speak is extremely important. Just going back to the fundamentals, I words, I use a lot of I words instead of you words when you are, when you have to put the hammer down sometimes, but also it's important to motivate and incentivize rather than tell people what to do. There's a difference between me saying, Hey, I need you to make a hundred thousand dollars worth of sales today. Like you just need to do it or else versus, Hey, if you can make the company a hundred thousand dollars today, here's an incentive for you. But also this is what this will be able to do for you. How can this help you help me? It's, mm. it's, it has to be a win-win relationship all around or else why are they motivated to do it? You don't want to be leading people under a gun. You want to be making people want to do what you want them to do. Now, let me ask you this, because when I had my large companies, I didn't have a lot of millennials working for me. It was 10, 15 years ago when we had the huge stuff. And you guys were still, I think, coming onto the market. The I'm old. Yeah. So we, we had a thing where there's a certain line that's really hard to deal with between being professional people and being friends. And sometimes uh, in the business that I was in or that time, crossing the friend zone sort of era led to some abuse because they would start goofing off. And I'm not friends with Chris. You'd never fire me. I'm friends. And I'm be like, yeah, I think I am going to fire you. But maybe millennials are different in the experience of how you guys do business. What do you think about that? Is there still a line of not being too close to friends that, that you're taking advantage of? Or how does that play out? There is definitely that line, but mm -hmm. the way that I figured out works best for me, and it might not work for everybody, but I am, I would say I'm a nice person and I'm very friendly and I want to be as friendly as possible with my team. Therefore, my mentality is if I'm not good at something, then I'm going to get someone on my team who is good at it. Mm -hmm. My COO is all about the numbers, all about productivity, all about the results. And if they're not generating results, I might not be the one putting down the hammer. It might be him. I think there is a line between friends and you know professionalism. But at the end of the day, I found that I have my own strengths and weaknesses, and I love to be friendly with people. And when it comes to a business, I believe that it's important to focus on your strengths and then add to your team people who are strong at what you're weak at. So for example, my COO is more results oriented, more productivity oriented. And so he can be the one to drop the hammer where necessarily I'm not the one to do it, which might seem horrible. But at the end of the day, I think true friends understand the balance of this is what I need to do to make sure that the company is best interests are at hand. And if I'm not, 
meeting those expectations, then, hey, maybe someone needs to replace me or I need to work my, my, my tail harder. I think that's where true friends are. It's always, uh, it, that is a little bit easier if you can get somebody else to do the firing, but I always like to fire people. But I never fire anybody who doesn't have it coming. So that's the, that's the good part. And the way that I like to explain that is I don't necessarily like to fire people. They fire themselves. That's very true. That's very true. But I think it's interesting, the aspect, maybe you can be more friendlier with millennials. I know that they have a different outlook towards work. And I, it's interesting some of the things you've talked about where you convince them on how it works for them and, and selling it works for them. Me, I, I would just whip the whip and be like, Give me some more money, God damn it! No, I'm just right. kidding. I wasn't that. I wasn't that bad, but I might have been sometimes. There was another thing that you made a, a comment about that I thought was a really interesting perspective at how you you try to work on the business and not in the business. Now that you've built it as successful, do you want to tell us a little bit more about that and how it works? So, as the CEO of the company, I read a book called Traction EOS hmm. System, and I see myself as a visionary, as the person pushing the growth. My guys, my team should be able to work on the day-to-day. -day. Of course, there's still fires that need to be put out, which is why I like to say I'm an adult babysitter and chief firefighter. But I think it's important for you to be able to take a step back from what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis, look at your business as a whole, and see exactly what steps you can take, maybe 10, 20 steps into the future, on how you think the business should go direction-wise. And if you're looking from within the business, it's hard to really set that direction or set that future goal. So I think that's why it's important to be working on your business and not inside. There you go. And that's really important. A lot of people don't realize how important the vision part is. I was really lucky. I had a partner for 13 years where I could be the visionary and I could come up with the ideas. I could build a widget on like the model of what to do. And then I can hand it to him. And he was, he loved the repetitive nature of stuff. He would do the repetitive stuff. And so he would take the model that I would give him and he'd make it work. But I was always the guy that they throw out of the helicopter in the middle of Nam and build a facility. And, and I love that. That was the juice for me. And, but for him, he couldn't deal with it or do it. Like if I sent him home with the yellow pad, uh, for the weekend, I'd be like, come up with some ideas. He'd come back and be like, I got, I got nothing. I'm like, come on, right. just one idea, just no matter how bad or stupid, you couldn't write one thing down. Didn't get it, but he was really good at doing that repetitive stuff. And so he was good at doing that portion of mine. And so knowing you're knowing what you're doing and how you're doing it, like you're what you're doing with your, where you're putting people in charge of your business, you're getting them to do a run it and you're, and then you can spend time focusing on that big vision because if you don't have it, a lot of stuff can happen in a business where if you're not focused on the vision, the changes in the market, the adjustments, looking at your business from a top down aspect, if you will, you can get really surprised with the market changes or something happens that can be disruptive. And sometimes it can put you out of business and you've got to watch out for those things. Definitely. My biggest fear is not necessarily going back to rock bottom, but the opportunities that could be missed if your eyes aren't open. Mm -hmm. you know, take every opportunity is my thing. Say yes. <laughs> yeah. Go up. And You've got to lead the business. I, I liken it to being like a captain on a ship and you've got to constantly be watching the horizon. You got to be constantly on the lookout, seeing where the ship is heading into, not necessarily be in the ship going, where's the ship at right now? What are we doing and how are we doing it? And is the, is the gears going around the oil and all that sort of stuff that makes the ship run? But somebody's going to be on deck looking forward going, are you going into any icebergs? Where are we headed to? What does the map say? What does the weather thing say? And uh, are we going the right direction? And it's that old classic thing where there's no really straight line a business or a ship does. It's a zigzag where you're constantly readjusting and tweaking and, and finding in the place for it. Yeah. What do you see as the future of your company going on? Do you, do you see you expanding in maybe other online aspects or are you just growing the business to, to saturate as many people to know about what you guys do, how you guys do it and sell it and stuff? Uh, are you going to make any print catalogs you can sell out or yellow pages? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so I think growth is extremely important. If you're not growing, you're declining. And so growing in what way is the question? And I think it's, especially with today's age, my goal is to make my company more tech. Right? Mm. How do we automate more systems? How do we integrate our sales processes to be a little bit more technical, whether that be creating an app, we're looking into creating an app. Mm. But also, I think it's important that you stay grounded and have certain fundamentals. For example, there's an opportunity for us to tackle more of the wholesale and manufacturing market. 
Right? No. That's not very sexy, not as sexy as maybe making an app or automating systems, but it's an opportunity. So I feel like I need to open my eyes and just make sure that I see everything on the horizon. And going back to recapping what I said, that's wholesale. That's making my company more technical, but also increasing the amount of locations that we have and going global. We do so globally right now, but we're not focusing our advertising on the global market. And so there's just so much room to just grow and expand. The question is what's next, right? What is the next stepping stone so that I can get to the next step after that? That's really interesting. You hit the word that I was looking for, the sexy word of being in a sexy business. A lot of people, when they look at businesses nowadays, the app or something that's hot and whatever, but you guys are in a business that's, like you said, it's not sexy, but it's necessary and it has a huge market. How well do you find that uh, deals with other competitors or do you have any competitors that are as technical as you guys are in the marketplace? I have competitors and I would say um, my competitors are probably your age, not assuming anything. Nah. <laughs> but they, I would say that we are very technologically, what whatever the word is opposite of advanced, mm. uh, unadvanced. And so I would say we have a leg up in the game. But there you go. At the end of the day, people are going to catch up. They can hire people who have the same types of expertise as me to get to that point. So you always have to be going and going. And so going back to that sexy word that you say, I think a lot of kids my age, I don't want to say kids, young adults my age, and especially aspiring entrepreneurs are really focusing on the sexy. What's sexy? What's new? How can yeah. I go into this tech? That they're missing out on so many opportunities on the foundations of old businesses that aren't so sexy that you can make sexy. What, what opportunities are out there that don't, that don't have as many eyes focused on them? And then mm -hmm. take that and make money on that. Utilize that as a capital gainer. And then maybe you can go do some sexy stuff. And there's a lot less competition in the non-sexy market. Everyone's going for the sexy market. Right. So there's a lot less competition everything else. I've been visiting Utah, normally in Las Vegas, but I've been using uh, Utah with family during the coronavirus. And we have a lot of trailer parts. We have trailer people that make parts. And yeah, you're right. It's run by a lot of guys like me with the shit kicker boots. And they're like, ah, what's, what's a comparator? And I don't, I don't know about all. Being in a non-sexy business means the competition is a lot lower. And I remember years ago, I forget his name, but... He, he, everyone was doing all this conglomerate stuff and buying and building businesses. And he went into, he was the CEO of Built Waste Management Incorporated. And no one had ever thought that you should take all these mafia guys and all these weird little mom and pops and build a nationwide conglomerate of collecting garbage. And it wasn't sexy, wasn't hot, but there's money in it because everyone's got to get rid of garbage the city's got to pay for it and so he built waste management incorporated by buying all these little mom and pops putting them together and and now they're a huge company probably global at this point but yeah, i remember I think, the story years ago i think people everything that you see in the news is elon tesla yeah. this new app this new technological advancement that people often look over the fact that everyday businesses can be just as successful Everyday businesses, the necessities that need to get taken care of are an essential part of making the world run. Because at the end of the day, it's also not about, not all about success, not all about the money, right? You can, just like you said, your friend, open up a waste management company and it'd be huge. I have a trailer parts company that's huge. I have a friend who has an e-commerce toilet paper company that's huge. <laughs> you can take anything and make successful. It doesn't have to be sexy. So for those who are looking into trying to get into something, I think it's important that you be cognizant of the fact that there are non-sexy businesses that you can become successful in. What's the name of the toilet paper company? Because we reviewed somebody during the pandemic. <laughs> they Honestly, do bamboo I, I'm toilet not paper. Sure. Oh, okay. I'm not sure. I don't have that off the top of my head. But we had a company during the pandemic when all the toilet paper sold out and crap that they were in, they were creating this new subscription model of a toilet paper business and the toilet paper is made of bamboo, which is sustainable hmm. or that's the right word. And, and, and then you buy it on a subscription. So it's like a, it's one of those subscription boxes you get in the mail and you get TP and it worked out good for them that they were in the business because 
all of a sudden they, they hit this huge demand thing. They got inventory and uh, they're trying to get in a leg in edgewise. So we ended up reviewing them and uh, yeah, it just worked good for them. It happened also with a mask company about six months before the pandemic, I was getting colds and on flights and I reached out to this mask company and they're like, yeah, here's some masks and stuff. And it turns out that worked out really great when the pandemic hit. So sometimes you just never know non-sexy businesses that no one thinks is going to be hot, but you have a whole lot less competitors to deal with. And you don't have people after you all day long creating the newest, biggest, you know, like you say, with Elon Musk, that you, you can just drop a few billion and suddenly he's your competitor. Same thing with Facebook. But at the end of the day, you can take a non-sexy business and integrate sexy components into it. And I there think you that's go. where the success is. Yeah, because you clean it up. You're not meeting with that. I remember when I was a kid, we go, you need a starter and you go down a little auto parts place. So, well, you go down to the junkyard. And you buy the cheap starter and they pull out a thing. And sometimes you have to go through the car thing and pull it out of the deal. And you're dealing with some guy who hasn't, who doesn't look like he's showered for five days and he's covered in grease. He's like, what are you doing? Just buy the starter. Just go get it out of the fucking yard. It's not very sexy back in those days. But if you can add those emblems that you're talking about, I think that's what waste management did. They, they took away the mafia guys who were in trucks and breaking people's legs and stuff for contracts and stuff. And they cleaned it up, made it all corporate. Same thing you can say with what, what the guy did with, I can't remember his name. I want to say Hugh, uh, Howard Hughes. Th yeah, same thing I, with I, Howard I Hughes. You weren't talking about Hugh Hefner. Yeah, yeah I was. I ha I was saying <laughs> Hugh Hefner in my brain. I'm like, he did do that to that, but that's a sexy business. <laughs> there you go. That's definitely a sexy business, my friend. So uh, Howard Hughes did that to Vegas. When he went to Vegas, it was just a bunch of mob stuff and poorly run businesses and shoddy. And he came in and started buying people out. And he put the corporate sheen on it. He started running it like a business and, and started dealing with the sexy and all that sort of good stuff. I think you could say the same thing of the other CEO who really refine Las Vegas. And I'm thinking of him. He built the Bellagio, took over the Mirage and he has his own, he has his own hotel there, but he had to step down over some of the me too stuff. But this is what a lot of businesses can do. You put the sexy on it. You know, you take, you take the paper clip that everyone's seen a million times, you put colors on it. Suddenly people want to buy it because they like colors. I saw this one uh, lady who she decided there wasn't power tools for women. So she started making her own line of drills and hacksaws and everything pink which is what color that uh, women like better. Yeah. And they were made more for women. Maybe, I don't know, handles or uh, whatever it is. It just made more women friendly. And there you go. More sexy, more hot. Who knew power tools were sexy? There's a joke in there somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> just leave right. it be. <laughs> so um, what have we discussed or, or touched on about your business? What haven't we touched on within my business? Let's see here. We've had many, you see the accolades of every single business, but you don't see the downs mm -hmm. of every business. And yeah. I touched on it briefly. I was 17, fell into a lot of debt. And I think it's important that people understand that for the first three or four years that I ran my business, I paid myself minimum wage. And so every single dollar that the company made went back into the business and still does to this day. I make sure I invest every dollar back into my business. So if you want your business to grow, there's a difference between running a business to make money, right? You want some pocket change, great. You're going to stay stagnant. You like your business at a certain size, great. Keep on doing what you're doing. But it takes years and years of not only time, energy, but also money that you make going back into the business for the business to become as successful as you want it to be. So it's not all daisies. Entrepreneurship is a very sexy word right now, but it's tough every single day. It's tough. Yeah. How do you find the motivation to keep going? Some people, they get spoiled, they get comfortable. Some people, they're still hungry. They're still chasing it. The first three years, like you say, you're paying yourself minimum wage. I know what those days are like. We used to live like 18 hour days and it was on top ramen. Thank God we were young like you. We did it. I couldn't do that today. But so my business would have to be napping if I did that sort of business that I was doing back then. It would have to be professional napping, which is what I am now, a professional <laughs> napper and podcaster. But how do you keep motivated through those times? What was it that got you through them? I think it's just, I'll be honest, as cliche as it is, it's probably my mother and my family. My family, my mother and my father had mm -hmm. actually moved from Thailand to have me here. Oh. And so it's important for me to make sure that I make the most of my opportunity and at the same time, be successful enough to where if anything happens to my family or my mother, 
that I'd be able to take care of them. So until I get to that point, or until I get to the point that I feel comfortable enough to take care of that, I don't think the fire in me is going to die. And yes, certain fires have died. Yes, I'm not working eight to two o'clock every single morning, picking up and throwing tires. I have other people doing that, but I'm thinking nonstop. At the end of the day, I think it's important that you're passionate about what you want to do. And what I'm passionate about is seeing growth, not only in the business, but in my own people, growth in my team, growth mm -hmm. in any aspect at all. And that's what I look forward to seeing every single day. You bring up something I overlooked in my business. Uh, you've cited the rule that we all have. Uh, anything that isn't growing is dying. But I never really looked at growth in my team. That was probably a uh, short side of my thing. I looked at the growth in their paychecks and if they were going up or dying, you know, there's performance and all that sort of good stuff. But I didn't really looked at growth in them in, as human beings or as workers in my thing. They were all in sales. So you're just selling the same shit different day. But I never really looked at that. That's, a, that's an interesting point that you bring up. Yeah. I think it's really important just because a lot of times looking from a high level, you're looking at P&Ls, right? X amount of dollars spent on payroll. But sometimes you forget to realize that every single dollar is allocated to a specific person. And that person's human too. You know, what happens when you automate a certain system and you do have to let go of a person? You want to have that good conscience to know that, hey, they started out as a $10 an hour employee and now they're a salary $50,000 a year person. And you were a part of that. So I think it's important for that aspect of things as well. But also, if you're growing your business, you're either hiring more qualified people or you cultivate your current people to be those qualified individuals. And I'd much rather have the latter. Yeah, most definitely. It makes all the difference. I think there were times where we tried to, sometimes we pr promote people. There were some times where we just didn't have it quite perfected, where we try and make a great salesman a manager, and he just oh, wanted to fit yes, as a manager. Peter yeah. yeah, What? tell us about that. I have, and that's why I think it's extremely important for you to talk to your guys about what their hopes and dreams are. I have a guy who works for me who's, been my longest standing employee, worked for me since I was 15 years old. And he wants to stay outside and package. That's all he wants to do. He wants to just package. He doesn't want to be a manager. He doesn't want to do any of that. And we've offered him those positions before, but you got to understand, I believe, where they want to go and where they want to be. Because if they do want to be a manager, then what are the steps and what are the performance aspects that you need to see before they can become a manager? If they don't want to become a manager, then why promote somebody who doesn't want to be a manager? Mm -hmm. yeah. But if a person is extremely good at their job in order to be promoted to a management position, they have to, at least in my company, show that they have leadership skills, management yeah. skills, because they're not only going to be a manager, they're going to be doing their job on top of leading their team underneath. Yeah. So why do you call it the Peter principle? It's, it's a principle that I heard when I was in Vistage. Vistage is a business coaching group. I'm not sure if you're familiar, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. every single month, a group of 10 entrepreneurs or founders come in together and talk through their business problems and all that good stuff. And it was a topic that we talked about at one point where it's, I have this badass, badass employee mm -hmm. and I want them to become a manager just because they're so good at what they do. And we fall into that trap of making that person, that Peter, that's why it's called a Peter principle, oh. Peter into a manager, whereas he's not really fit to be a manager. He's just really good at what he does. Oh, okay. So that's I was thinking it might be other. like Peter Pan or something. I don't oh know. no, nothing as fancy as that. <laughs> I thought it was me, I, but that's, but that does make sense. We had a lot of failures in that. And the problem is once you promote a manager, if they fail, it's really hard to kick him back to being a salesperson. It's and, impossible. Uh, you, yeah. you demote somebody, then all of a sudden the morale is down. And they yeah. don't have the same reputation that they did. And it's a whole, yeah. Yeah, you really fuck up their mojo. And and there's some people that are they're good, they're good. And it's always a challenge in trying to do that because you're, you're trying to, like you say, build a better company. Sometimes it's better to hire from outside if you have to. So this has been really wonderful. You shared a lot of really cool stuff about how to build a company, how to be successful. And of course, what you guys are doing at the company. Any aspects before you go out at what you want to plug about what you guys are doing, how you're doing it? Uh, really, the only message that I think that I have is there's a lot of people who want to be entrepreneurs right now. A lot of people, especially 14, 15 high schoolers. And my message is it's possible, but it's hard. It's possible. It's hard. You will work your ass off like nothing else, but it will make you uh, so much more self-actualized than you can ever imagine. You will learn a whole lot about yourself. Two things that I tell myself. 
it is one, everything happens for a reason. You get mm. beat back down, you go back up every single time. <laughs> Don't give up as cliche as that sounds. And number two, so everything happens for a reason. What was my number two? Goodness gracious. Oh yeah. You can, if you will, it like just that. depends on what sacrifices that you're willing to make to do it. Yeah. Uh, you can, if you will, that sounds like a great shirt or tea or hat, oh, yeah. you know, or, or the, then the title of your book, you should do a book on that. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Definitely. Definitely. It's been wonderful, Tyler, to spend some time with you and all that good stuff. Give us the plug so people can uh, check out your guys' website and uh, order some stuff up on it. Oh yeah. So uh, my website is Tyler dash Bray, B R A Y.com. But I post a lot on my social media mm -hmm. official Tyler Bray. And that's on Instagram. The majority of my posts are going to be on Instagram, YouTube, and all that good stuff. But you can check out everything on Instagram where I talk about culture. I have articles posted on Forbes about workplace, my story, what I've done, how I've become successful, and also the downfalls that I've faced. So mm -hmm. yeah, go check out my social medias and also some of the articles on Forbes. There you go. There you go, guys. And then give us the .com for the trailer company if you yes. haven't already. So my online website is the trailer parts outlet. Dot com. There you go, guys. And thanks for spending some time with us, Tyler. I love having these conversations, especially with young entrepreneurs, because I started my first company like you. I was 18. You were much younger. So congratulations. And it's really weird when you get to my age, you look back on the journey of it all. So have fun. Enjoy yourself. Be sure to look around as you go through the ride, man. <laughs> Take some well, time to look around. <laughs> thank you, Chris, for having me. It was definitely a pleasure. I had a lot of fun. Thank you very much. Guys, be sure to check him out, learn more, and all that good stuff. Also, go to see the YouTube version of this at youtube.com forward slash Chris Voss. Hit the bell notification. You'll be seeing this on our groups on Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, Instagram as well. Thanks so much for tuning in. Be sure to wear your mask, stay safe, and we'll see you guys next time.